Good morning. It's kind of strange seeing y'all in daylight, but it's good to see you. Uh, Real quick, before we get into our sermon for this morning, I just wanted to say a word about the trunk retreat next week. My plan is that we would do what we ended up doing last year as kind of an emergency backup, and that we'll, we'll hold it inside again this year. So if you are planning on decorating for that, Um, You can either decorate like an area of the building or a room. Um, Last year we did it last minute because of the rain, but everybody seemed to love it. And so we're going to give it another shot. If you hate it, let me know after, okay? So uh, we'll we'll switch it back for next year. Um, But if you want to decorate, just, I guess, get here early on Sunday sometime and, and decorate or throughout the week if it's an empty classroom, that kind of thing. But that's next Sunday night following our worship. This morning, we're talking about a story that most of us have probably known since Sunday school, and that is the story of Daniel and the lion's den. But this is not a children's story. Now, the opening chapters of Daniel uh, feature lions and fire and miraculous dreams, all of these, these amazing things that really do make for great material for, for a VBS or for Sunday school or for a devotional, whatever it is. But I think if we only read them through those lenses, I think we miss how serious these stories are and all of the the incredible wisdom that they have to offer for our very modern moment where we are not finding ourselves in dens full of lions, but maybe in in a different way, we're finding ourselves in a similar situation. So this morning, we're talking about exile. Going back to 587 B.C., The nation of Israel was attacked by the Babylonian Empire. They were conquered. Thousands of Israelites were slaughtered, and the survivors were forced to leave their homes and to serve Babylon in a foreign land. And in that moment, they were were faced with some heavy moral decisions. Do we bow to the the emperor? Do we worship the Babylonian gods? After all, our god lost, right? If you're in the Israelite frame of mind, what do we do? now that it feels like God has abandoned us here in Babylon. So they were facing these questions. If we're putting them in our modern day, they might be questions like, what do we do about abortion, about immigration, climate change, IVF, gun control, police brutality, whatever it is, you fill in the blank, whatever whatever raises your blood pressure right there. What do we do? with those complicated moral questions. Those are the questions that they, in a different way, are facing. And there were two ways that people responded, two main streams that they went down. The first was to revolt, to violently fight back. And the second was to compromise, to give in, to accept the Babylonian way of life, the Babylonian gods as their own. These were the two main ways. But then this this older prophet named Jeremiah sits down to write a letter, and in his letter, he presents to them a third option. Not compromise, not revolt, but a third way. This is Jeremiah 29, verses 5 through 7. He says, build houses and live in them. These are instructions to these exiles. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city, where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Now this, this is unexpected, because if you notice, there's still, there's still some tension here. Like if you're, if you're skimming through, you see that he, he says there, there in exile, and he, and he calls it exile, and he, he talks about its welfare which is connected, but is also separate from your welfare, right? So there, there's that side of this tension. But also, if, if we're looking at it, it's not revolt or compromise that he advises. It's something that cuts across both options. He tells them to put down roots, right? He says, build houses, plant gardens, build families, put down roots here in Babylon. It's this, this strange ethic of peace. And if your question is, what does that look like in real life? Well, then I have a great news for you, and that is that the book of Daniel is written to show us what this looks like in real life. 
to say that Jeremiah's peace ethic lived out looks like this. So Daniel and his friends are just baptized into an impossible moral situation when they're teenagers. They're taken captive by Babylon because they show promise. They're made to work in the Babylonian government. By the time we get to to Daniel chapter 6, Daniel is more advanced in years, and he's about 82 years old at this point. So he's been playing this game for a long time. He's been walking this this impossible tightrope between giving in and fighting back. Do I give in? Do I fight back? What do I do? Because he literally works in the Babylonian government. He's in the belly of the beast. So day in and day out, this is where his paycheck is coming from. His working hours are going to this. This is his career. So at, at least indirectly, he's contributing to the machine. He's indirectly helping Babylon to do some pretty terrible things. Daniel and his friends are involved here. So, this whole time, they're, they're under immense pressure to compromise, right? Either to compromise or maybe, maybe gain the king's trust and then take him down from the inside. One or the other. To revolt or to compromise. And at first, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. If you're, if you're reading the book of Daniel, they start out and they have names that call on the Israelite god. El is what they called their god. So, Dan. Yell. So El, the name of God, is featured in his name, which is also a great name in my opinion. Um, so the name of God featured in his name. Well, when he and his friends get to Babylon, they're given new names. They, they were featuring the God of Israel. Now his new name is Bel- Belshazzar, Bel, Babylonian God. So they replaced the Israelite God with the Babylonian God in their names. And they use those new names, okay? So that's a little weird. You might expect that if they're going to stand strong for God, that they would stick with their, their original names. But they use their new names. And then also, again, they, they work for Babylon, right? They're, they're contributing to this machine. And so if you're reading through Daniel and, and you don't have the lens that maybe sometimes we put on that if he's in the Bible, he's got to be perfect, right? If you're reading through, it feels kind of icky. Like it, it kind of looks like compromise, that they're just doing whatever they have to do to get ahead. But... When you're reading through, you come to chapters like chapter 3, and this morning we'll be in chapter 6, and you find these moments when they're put in, in impossible situations where they have to decide what to do, these moral dilemmas. And in those moments when, when a line is drawn in the sand, what we find is that they don't revolt and they don't compromise. They actually embody two different things at the same time. They embody loyalty and subversion loyalty and subversion. And so they're loyal to the empire. They're not violent. They're not hateful. They're good neighbors and employees and friends. They're loyal. They're not, they're not fighting back with violence. They're seeking Babylon's good. But, but even though they live in Babylon, even though they talk and dress and look like Babylonians, they're still subversive to the empire. Because in these moments when it's, it's right or wrong, they always choose to stick with the ethic of Jeremiah. So this morning, we're putting this loyal and subversive ethic to the test. We're going to talk about it this morning, and then tonight we'll explore more in detail, particularly with Jesus, and then applying it to us. But this morning, we'll be in Daniel chapter 6 with Daniel in the lion's den. And remember, Daniel is an older man at this point, and the, if he's, he's living through a transition to a new empire. So he's been serving Babylon this whole time, but now Persia has taken over. Persia is the ruling emperor of the world. And Daniel is living through this transition. And if you're skimming through Daniel chapter 6, you'll see that this this is an action-packed story. It's just riveting content. If you're just skimming uh, verses 3 through 6, it says, Then this Daniel, then the high officials, then these men said, then these high officials. So it's 15 times the word then appears in this story. It's action-packed over and over again. We're, we're, we're twisting and turning throughout this chapter. It's all a whirlwind. And for Daniel, he's living through this whirlwind where there is a new king on the block. His name is Darius. Darius is an old politician. He's been doing this for his whole life. And he's 62 years old. And he's reached the pinnacle. He is the most powerful person on the planet. He's made it. Okay? So that's Darius. And he takes over this kingdom, and one of the first things that he does is to reorganize his government beneath him, okay? And he, 
one of the things that he does for that is to place three people directly beneath him in power. One of those three people is Daniel. Now remember, Daniel's not Babylonian, he's not Persian, he's Judean, he's a Jew. But here he is, second level of the most powerful emperor empire on the earth, and he's one of the three. Not only that, but if, if we're reading verse 3, it says, Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So not only is Daniel one of three officials right underneath the king, he's actually about to become second in command of the entire kingdom. Now that does not go over well with the other two high officials that he has been equal with. If you, if you glance at verse 10, you'll see that they say that there's no way that they're going to let this exile from Judah. That's what they call it, the exile from Judah. He's not going to take this position, get this promotion over them. So they, they go to work. Verse 4, the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Now, this is, this is the worst kind of guy to plan an evil conspiracy against, right? He is just too stinking good. He is, he's faithful, it says. There's nothing wrong with him. He's the worst if you're trying to, you know, trap him in his, in his ways and bring him down. He's, this is the worst kind of guy. But that's exactly what they realize. And that is how they can get him. They can put him in a tension between loyalty to the state and loyalty to his God. Because what they know, and what we're about to read, is that every day, probably for 60 plus years at this point, Daniel gets down on his knees three times a day, and he prays toward Jerusalem. He prays toward home for them. Jerusalem's the holy city, the home of their God. So he gets down on his knees, he opens a window, he prays toward Jerusalem. He's still 60 plus years into this experience. He's still orienting his life toward Jerusalem. So they know that that's where they can get him. Read verses 6 and 7 with me. These high officials and satraps come to the king and they say to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction, that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions." Now, if you're Darius, it sounds pretty good. You are looking more powerful in the new kingdom that you are over. So he signs this, and then the conspirators meet up because they're ready to watch Daniel fall into their beautiful trap. So verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed. Okay, pause there. So Daniel knows what's happened, and all he has to do is close the window, right? That's all he has to do. Or just wait till it's nighttime, snuff the candle out, and then pray. That's all he has to do. It's not, not that hard, not that creative. And after all, if you're Daniel, you can do a lot more good for God, alive than dead, right? Like, that, that sounds good. You're about to be the second in command of, the, of the, the emperor that's ruling over the earth. So if you're Daniel and you're, you're in this situation, if, if you're like me, you probably are just closing the window, right? Like, that, that's probably my first move. But that's not what Daniel does, because something about, something about this moment, out of all the complicated moments that Daniel's faced in his life, something about this feels like compromise. For him, there's a line in the sand, and he won't cross it. And so he opens his windows, and he prays. He went to his house, it says in verse 10, where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Now, you know what happens. Um, his enemies come running to the king with their smoking gun to report that his, his beloved advisor has openly flaunted his decree. And, and you know what that means, Darius. Those lions are getting hungry, right? So that, that's what they're, they're running to the king with this news. And the king is distraught. He tries everything he can to free Daniel. But in verses 16 and 17, the king commands and Daniel is brought and cast into the den of lions. And the king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. This word den really refers to, to an underground pit with an opening at the top. So essentially, th this, is, this is a cave filled with lions that was used for capital punishment for any enemy of the king who needed to 
die as punishment. They were thrown into this pit full of lions, and a stone is rolled in front of the pit or over the pit, so there's no escape. It was a very effective motivation for not getting on the king's bad side. And that's, that's what this is. Also, it's kind of strange that this, this is a story we tell our kids, but that's, that's kind of beside the point. Uh, but starting in verse 19, at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Now this is the only time, if you read through the entirety of Daniel 6, it's the only time that Daniel speaks only time that he's recorded as speaking out loud, or we're given his words, at least. I think that's intentional by the the narrator here. I think it's intentional that he only depicts Daniel as speaking this one time, because notice the content of what he says. He says, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. I think the point is to emphasize that Daniel is delivered here from, from the mouths of the lions, not because of himself, but because of his God that he's delivered because of his faith. That in the end, Daniel's faith in his God is what delivered him. Not not his relationship with the most powerful man on the planet, the all-powerful king of Persia. That's not what delivered him in the end. It was his faith. And, And more particularly, it was his faith in God that caused God to deliver him. So God delivers him. Verse 22, so Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. His faith is what delivered him. So Daniel didn't didn't assassinate Darius after gaining his trust and he didn't didn't close the window. He didn't revolt or compromise. He chose the third way, this nonviolent, peaceful resistance in the form of faith. And in the end, this is... What, how God takes down the control of the empire, how God uses his power, the third way, to take control or to subvert the evil of the empire. Verses 25 to 27, this is really breathtaking when you think about it. This is the emperor of the world, the Persian pagan king. He writes to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Now that's a nice story. When we get to the end of Daniel chapter 6, it's it's really a breathtaking story because it it raises your adrenaline, but also it it makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside at the end. It's, It's kind of scary, but also exciting. It's all the best things that we want in a story. But it's also more than that. And I say that because of this. Um, Ken, you might have to go to the next slide for me. So there are three slides of this, so I'm not probably going to read out all of them. But if you are interested in this, you you can take pictures of them. But notice that the parallels here abound between Daniel and Jesus, who we'll focus more on in our sermon tonight. That the presidents and satraps conspired against Daniel, so did the chief priests and elders in Jerusalem. And both prayed before they were arrested. And if you want to go to the next one, Kim, we'll just skim over um, the three here. So this is the second one. Uh, for instance, this last one, Daniel descends into the pit. Jesus' body was laid in a tomb, a cave, much like Daniel's pit. And then one more slide of um, parallels here, that the, the fulfillment of Daniel, this is the point, that the character of Daniel finds its fulfillment in Jesus. If you were able to to skim through, and if if you want this in detail, I'll be happy to give it to you after, but that the character of Daniel, everything that he goes through in this account, finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Everything that Daniel was and wanted and, and wanted to be finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Now, Daniel dies in exile, right? Daniel never comes home. And that's one reason why 
I think this story leads us to Jesus. Also, the book of Daniel is very different from other books. For instance, Job. If you separate the book of Job into a bunch of different parts, it's not going to make any sense. But if you separate the book of Daniel into the separate chapters, they're, they're kind of like sitcoms where they stand on their own. And when you get to the end of the book, there's, there's not like a, a clear conclusion to the book. Like there is in Job, it wraps up very nicely. Ecclesiastes, the same way. But Daniel is, I think, intentionally a little bit of a loose end. Because I think it leads us to this hope. It leads us to the hope that if we hold on in faith, no matter how many lions are around us, that if we hold on in faith, that we will one day find our deliverance. And for us, we find it in the person of Jesus. Because he's promised that one day he's returning and that he's going to bring us home from our exile here on this earth as it is. I want to share this story with you as we wrap up together. This is, you might recognize it, this is uh, called The Shire. It's from The Lord of the Rings, and The Lord of the Rings has this story about um, four very pedestrian characters called hobbits. They're just normal people. They're from this place called The Shire. It's it's little, it's beautiful, it's peaceful. They love their country, they love their, their people, they love their life. But they're swept away into an adventure that's far beyond anything they could have imagined. And they encounter things that they, they never would have dreamt up, just utter darkness and terror that they encounter. And they have to lead the Shire to do this in order to save the Shire. So they lead the Shire, they encounter all of these adventures, eventually they, they win in the end, okay? And then they come back home, and happily ever after is the idea. But it doesn't quite work out like that, because when they get back, something is, is different. They're back, they're back home, they've saved the Shire, but something is different, because There's a strange paradox where, on the one hand, because of everything that they've gone through, all of the darkness and adventures, because of all of that, they're now leaders in the Shire. Because things that used to maybe frighten them, things that frighten the the normal people in the Shire now, they don't frighten them anymore. They're able to deal with things that other people aren't able to deal with. So they're leaders now. But at the same time, just as they are effective, they're also outcast in some ways. They, don't, they come home, but it's not quite the same as it was. The Shire's the same, but they've changed. Because now they weep really easily, and they didn't used to do that. Now they laugh really deeply, they didn't used to do that. Now they, they sing these, these strange songs that no one else knows, they didn't used to do that. So something is different, and their, their fellow hobbits don't understand what's going on. But here's what happened. On their adventures, they encountered some people from a faraway land, from the land across the western seas. And those people changed something about them. Their experiences with those people changed something inside of them. And you might phrase it like this, that the soil where their souls were rooted in had changed. The soil of their souls, where their souls were rooted in, had changed. It used to be the Shire, but now it's not. So, now, it's the land over the sea. So now they, they walk down to the shore, and they're walking along, and they, they hear music from the sea that no one else can seem to hear. And that's because the Shire, this beautiful place, is not their country anymore. It is, but it's also not. They're home, but they're also not. And all the maps that are made in the Shire, they, they have the Shire, but then on, on the outskirts of it, it's just blank. It's just white. Because everyone who's in the Shire doesn't know what's beyond the Shire. But these hobbits, after their adventures, come home, and they, they know what's beyond. So that means that they are effective in their home now. They're good leaders. But it also means that, that they're a little bit left out. They're a little bit different from what they were because they're rooted somewhere else. I think this is a, this is a great story for you, for me, for Daniel. Because I think one of the reasons Daniel was so effective in his, his role there in Babylon, the reason he was about to become second in command of the entire kingdom, is because three times a day, every day, he got down on his knees and he prayed toward Jerusalem. That after all of those years, the soil where Daniel's soul was rooted wasn't in Babylon. It was over the sea, as it were. It was still in Jerusalem. It was still with his God. It didn't matter what happened around him. It didn't matter how many lions surrounded him. That wasn't his home. 
his home, was over the seas. They couldn't touch his soul. I think about Philippians chapter 3, which tells us that our citizenship isn't here on earth, it's in heaven, that our souls are rooted in a different place. And I think about Colossians chapter 3, which tells us that we're to seek the things that are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, because we have been risen with him. So the image here is that Paul, or Paul gives to us, is that we have been risen with Christ, so that our home, the, the soil where our souls are rooted, is in heaven, not here on earth. And I want to leave you um, with this one last text from Hebrews chapter 11. As we, as we count, encounter um, these next two or three weeks of the, the election and everything that surrounds it, all of the, the craziness that will happen over the next three weeks in all of our lives, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Now that them there is you and me, that he has prepared for us a city, if we follow him in faith. That's what Hebrews 11 is all about. It's the faith hall of fame, as we call it. That if we follow him in faith, we have a city prepared for us. That no matter what happens here in our nation, that we have a nation above where our souls are rooted. That my soul, your soul, is at home with Christ right next to the throne of God. So my invitation to you this morning is to reorient your life or to orient your life for the first time toward Jerusalem, toward the holy city of God. That three times a day, literally, or at least spiritually, we would pray toward our God, pray toward our home, to realize that that is where our souls are rooted in and not here on this broken iteration of our earth. That's my prayer for you. And my invitation for you is if you haven't oriented your life toward Jesus, toward heaven, toward that heavenly city, this is a great opportunity to do it as we stand and sing together.